it's still okay. We can talk about it on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hello, LA Comic Con. How's everyone doing? Thank you for coming to this panel, People of Color and Comics. I'm uh, one of the hosts of this podcast, Serving Up Comics. Um, my co-host will be joining me shortly, but we have a great panel today. I'm just going to uh, uh, introduce everyone, and they're going to say a little bit about themselves. But thanks for uh, thanks everyone for joining us on this uh, Sunday in foggy LA. Yeah. <laughs> so great to have um, um, next to me uh, Boyle Heights uh, fellow resident, Kaden Phoenix. Kaden, how are you? Wonderful, thank you. Hi. And next to her is. Uh, Maxi Rodriguez. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. And we have Giselle Omar. How are you? And we have, oh, sorry, and the uh, writer of Helm's Great Castle, we have uh, Henry Braz. Henry, how are you? So guys, uh, just tell us a little bit, just starting with... Uh, just, we could uh, go from um, Kaden, but tell us a little bit about just growing up, because, um, you know, you guys are all big comic fans that grew up in just, like, grew up in just uh, so much pop culture. How was it um, discovering characters like Static Shock or Vibe that were um, people that you resonated with? T tell us a little bit about that. So I did not grow up watching comics, and so I, I'm going to go separate on that question because I, I don't, um, I didn't watch comics, so in, but in a good way. So it worked like I watched TV and film, lots and lots of film, and so the stereotypes that I've seen, you know, looking back at the comics that were made, uh, obviously very white, male-centric comics, but when you look at a female, she's objectified, right? Like, we have to wear a bra and underwear to fly in the air for some reason. So there's certain things like, great, I'm glad I didn't grow up with that. Um, with that perspective in mind, because right? that's still the male gaze. It's not a female gaze. It's very much not a Latina gaze at all. So, like I was saying, movies, like I have Sigourney Weaver, I have Gina Davis, right? Because I'm a millennial, so I have all the great blockbuster action movies from the 90s. Uh, so that is what I use as my source of when I look back. And obviously the Disney princesses as well. I do Latina princesses and Latina superheroes, so they definitely have the big eyes. I don't know if you can see my shirt, but they have the big eyes and the soft chins, but they will save the day, right? So that's big blockbuster with Disney princesses kind of put together. And so that is that is my base. I don't know necessarily those superheroes, mm -hmm. uh, but like, do I know America Chavez? Yes, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I research. I do have to research, right? She's going to be in Doctor Strange coming up, but she's still not a lead character. Um, I'm not sure if we have any other. Like, we have independent Latino superheroes as well. That's um, that's my world. So that's kind of what I study. But uh, I don't necessarily. I wasn't raised with comics, but it, for it behooved me for that reason as well. Gotcha, uh, Maxi. Yeah. So um, I was actually six years old when I first picked up a Wonder Woman comic. And I was just like, ah, she's beautiful, but she kicks so much booty. <laughs> and my mom was actually a Wonder Woman fan when she was a little kid. And she's like, yeah, that's Wonder Woman. And I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, um, matter of fact, there's a, a TV show on her. And uh, my mom was a huge Linda Carter fan, so she showed me the actual live-action Wonder Woman. And I was like, oh, I want to be her one day. <laughs> so I would try to draw her, and then um, I got into the X-Men. And as you can see, it's all dudes. But, like, one thing I noticed was uh, everyone was skinny. And I was like, where are all the chubby girls? Because I was a chubby kid growing up. And, like, most of the time, the... Chubby characters were either the butt of the jokes or they were the villains. And they always had the weirdest, like, superpowers. Like, uh, for example, Big Bertha from Marvel Comics. She inflates and then she vomits to, you know, get thin. And as a little kid who was, like, so impressionable, I'm like, is that okay? I didn't try to replicate it, but still, it just... It just made me feel bad that that's how plus size people were being represented in the comics, and especially what was his face, the blob. The blob. There you go, the blob. Yeah, I didn't. Blob. Like, I did not like him either. Aww. The villain from the X Men. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's I, correct. I didn't like him either. I was like, uh, uh nope. Um, 
I, I'm not really too familiar with the, the two superheroes he had mentioned because there wasn't a lot of Latino or Latinx characters that I was familiar with, which was also disappointing. Because, um, like, I, I grew up with Storm, and I thought she was great. I was like, I love Storm. Um, but she was the only black superhero I was familiar with, and that was also, like, disheartening because I'm like, wait a minute, they're all white. Where are, like, the black superheroes? Where are the, the Latinx superheroes? And that was pretty disappointing as a kid, but it didn't stop me. You know, I still enjoyed my comics. I mostly read Wonder Woman. So I'm like, okay, this is the only, you know, this only cool superhero I'm going to read because at least she's cool. So, yeah, that's pretty much my story on it. Cool, thank you. Jizzo? Uh, yeah, uh, like Kaden, I didn't grow up on comics. I was big on pop culture, film, TV. And I got into graphic novels and comics back in 2013. I actually wrote a screenplay, and I was heavily influenced by Tarantino, Aronofsky, Fincher, um, all the film greats. And I thought, hey, this would actually make a really good comic book graphic novel. So that's when I started the journey of adapting it into a graphic novel. Um, I'm from Afghanistan, so uh, my book doesn't have to do with Afghanistan, but it does have a strong female lead. And in the future, I will be creating stories that are, have Afghan characters. Very good, very good. Uh, Henry? Hi, my name is Henry Barajas. Uh, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Oh, sh snap. That's what Tucson is doing here. Oh, cool. That's cool. never happened in the years of doing conventions. Uh, cool. Nice to meet you. Um, I, yeah, like my, uh, I was lucky because my parents were big thrifters and wanted to um, make money by buying junk. And uh, so we'd watch the Antique Roadshow on PBS, and Ooh. sometimes you would see a comic book worth thousands of dollars, and they would buy boxes of comics and make me uh, praise them. Yeah. <laughs> How much was it? Yeah, which none of them were worth anything, because they were the 90s, <laughs> Superman died, and ruined the comic book industry. Uh, so, so yeah, so I read so many comics, and uh, my parents were like, uh, they, they weren't religious people, but they were like the Simpsons in the sense that they would go to church and sit there and absorb nothing, <laughs> and learn nothing, and from what I, I, my church was comics, so got a lot of my morals and, and things like that from, from Spider-Man and Batman and Wonder Woman and and stuff. So I was a, like a savant. So like I would read uh, so many comics, but I couldn't do my times tables, you know. So um, it, I became obsessed. And but I, I had a hard time breaking in because no one really took me seriously. And I think it's because I was a Mexican guy from you know Arizona. And so I became a journalist. The barrier of entry was to be a writer full time was easier that way. And um, and then I uh, had lost my job as a journalist, and I was a radio show DJ and did comedy in Arizona. And then uh, John Lewis's March came out, which is a very influential comic that is about his time as a civil rights activist. And now he worked with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I realized that I could write a comic about my great-grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, a Chicano activist that helped one of the last Native American tribes gain federal recognition. And I could do that using pictures and words and not just do a biography because I was so automatically inclined to go prose. And that's what reignited me to be back into comics again as a professional because I'd, I'd been doing so many like ash cans and anthology stories and just couldn't get any headway that way. So, uh, But to your question, yeah, I mean, Static Shock, Dwayne McDuffie, one of the greatest comic book writers of all time. Amazing writer. Lost him way before we should have. Um, yeah, I loved that cartoon. Um, I think, uh, I hope next time we do a panel like this, we can have black or Afro-Latinx uh, mm -hmm. creators on the, you know, to have their voices heard because, um, you know, there's just uh, so many people that really need to tell their story and we need to learn more about because, as Caden said, it is a white-dominated uh, field, but slowly but surely we are inching towards more uh, inclusivity. Yes, yeah, exactly. Which, you know, that's what we want. Um, we have uh, one more guest joining us, uh, Cruz Castillo from the National Hispanic mm -hmm. Media yeah. Coalition. Everybody stare as he walks. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> Hi, Cruz. Thank you, Cruz. But yeah, just, um,
got it. Yeah, um, Henry, just going off of that, you talked a little bit about, you know, background and everything. Well, and we're all people of color, and, you know, we all want to be represented. How do you guys um, feel just about, you know, just making this, like, sphere of influence in your work and trying to be as inclusive as possible? Let's talk a little bit about who wants to uh, go first. Uh, uh, Henry does. Henry? <laughs> Uh, can you repeat that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so we were talking just a little bit about your background. Yeah. So what, um, talk a little bit about just, you know, because in Helm's Gray Castle, it's a, a lot of dealing with Az a lot of Aztec culture, and, you know, that's including um, a lot of, uh, in a lot of thing, um, aspects of, uh, of uh, kind of like Latino or Latino. Um, uh, Mesoamerican history. Yeah, Meso Mesoamerican um folklore that people may not know. Talk a little bit about just uh, having that in your work and let's all talk about just about being more inclusive. Sure. Um, so while I was doing uh, La Voz de Mayo at the Rambo, I found out that in the in like the mid 1500s the Spanish conquistadors had documented the Pascua Yaqui people. That is my mom's uh, family side of the indigenous equation to my life and I did not know that that's how far back that they, you know, dated. And then I realized I knew nothing about uh, Mexico or that my father, you know, my father, is, and he was born in Mexico. Um, so I didn't really know anything about myself. And it was really frustrating that being in, in Tucson, Arizona, Hispanic studies classes were uh, banned for, uh, for a little while until The Daily Show did a very uh, impactful episode on how backwards Arizona um, politics and the education there was. So at 30 years old, I became a, uh, borrowing this from John Leguizano, a ghetto Mesoamerican professor where I just like read a lot of textbooks and tried to discover more about my indigenous background. And uh, it was very empowering. And it was really hard to find um, Mexican or indigenous people to talk about the, Af the Mesoamerican history because it was all white or European uh, educators that were writing the books or doing the documentaries. So I found this book called Broken Spears. If you're interested in learning more about Mesoamerican history from the indigenous account, which heavily influenced Helm Gray Castle, I would uh, suggest going that route. But yeah, like um, I do my best to you know get everybody as much as I can involved. Like Tristan J. Tarwater is a non-gender conforming game writer who's um, Boricua. Uh, the artist uh, Ramah Handoko is based in Indonesia. The colorist is also based in Indonesia. The letterer Gabriel Downey is a Latina here from here in LA. So I do my best to get as many different people on projects. But um, there's always room to do more and do better and, and to get more people involved. And I'm always trying to expand my network when it comes to unheard voices. Yeah, that's all, you know, that's all we have to do. We get a lot of um, unheard voices out there. Um, Giselle. Yeah, to Henry's point, we can definitely do more. Uh, for 357 Magnum Opus, my book, uh, it's about a couple of bounty hunters from Las Vegas. So it wasn't something where I was looking for, uh, I was looking just to get it done after seven years. So, uh, but I do have two future projects, both with characters that are minorities and specifically we'll be working with uh, minority creators uh, to uh, help me make the story. So that includes the artists, the letterers, and the colorists. So I uh, want to be very specific and targeted toward the individuals I want to work with. So uh, it's really important that if I am going to uh, represent a sort of specific minority that I'm not a part of, that I do have <coughs> creators who are who can help me create that story. Yeah. Uh, Maxie? Uh, okay, so my turn, I guess. Mm -hmm. So going back to how I was disheartened as a kid, because uh, there was no plus-size characters, there weren't many characters of color. And I'm, I'm one of those types um, where I'm like, okay, if I don't see something that I like and it's not there, I'll just do it myself. So that's what I did. Um, in 2015, 2015, 2016, right after I graduated from Cal State Dominguez Hills uh, with my bachelor's, and working at the worst place in the whole world to work at, Knott's Berry Farm. Oh no, my gosh, what no, you, what no did you Knott's Berry Farm? So, um, I created a comic series called Chronicles of a Chubby Girl. Um, 
and it's about this plus size Latina girl. Um, she has this, this boyfriend who actually fits the stereotypical <coughs> handsome, beefy dude <laughs> stereotype. So he has that good body, and she's, you know, she's plus size. So I wanted to tackle like what it's like to be in a mixed size relationship because like some of the guys who date plus size girls are often seen as like, oh, you're into big girls, you're a chubby chaser, you fetishize chubby girls, which isn't true, because um, first-hand experience, my boyfriend fits that mold, and his handsome stallion is based on my boyfriend. Um, but at the time, he kept calling her my chubby bunny, and everyone called me the chubby bunny artist. So I had to change it to Chronicles of the Chubby Bunny, and since then, um, my comic is mostly, again, centered around this plus-size Latina. Um, she also has, you know, depression, anxiety. So, the, you know, my comic also handles what it, you know, dealing with mental health, uh, bad mental health, um, dealing with mixed-size relationships. And she just pretty, um, she just pretty also deals with stereotypical macho men from the, Lat the Latin community because, like, I grew up in a single mother home and she's straight up from Mexico, so I grew up with all that ranchera, Saturday morning, 6 a.m., get up to Vicente Fernandez, singing that <laughs> <laughs> um, And, um, like, I, I was so disheartened again by, like, the machismo, because I grew up around a bunch of those men, too. They're like, oh, no, don't cry. No me las niñas lloran, that kind of attitude kind of thing. And um, I also wanted to address that as well, because um, um, Handsome Stallion is not a typical Latino man. Like, um, he likes pedicures, he likes manicures, he puts lotion on his face, he cleans himself, he even likes pink stuff, plushies, he likes to garden. Um, so he doesn't fit that mold, and I wanted to also give guys that voice, like, it's okay to like girly things. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly fine. And it's like, you know, women, plus size women, especially women of color, especially if you're Latin Mexican American, because I'm Mexican American, mm -hmm. we're considered crazy because we don't take crap from anyone, which we're not crazy. We just don't mess with us. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to give those people that voice from my comic books, like, hey, we're not crazy. It's okay to have depression. It's okay to have anxiety. You know, there's ways to cope. And it's okay if you want a physically fit boyfriend. I mean, if he's hot and you like him, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. Um, I, I enjoy the humor, too, in the, in the, in the comic. You know, you, it's good to, like, just have, like, just humor in spite of, um, any, you know, any sort of adversity as well. Yeah, and there's a, an actual quote in my comic where um, uh, Chubby Bunny points out that Handsome Stallion likes girly stuff, and he's like, hey, a man's got to look good just to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, Kaden. Yeah, so I am the writer and the creator, and I do self-publish, and so the benefit of that is that I am in charge of everybody, so I can hire whom I like. So my pencil, ink, color, and letterist and graphic designer by default are a Latina artist as well for that reason because I believe in diversity on and off the page. And so, you know, on the page, my supporting, my superhero, my villain, my mentor, they're all Latinas. And so who best to relay that information, relay the story, but Latinas as well. So I found them all through Instagram. There's hashtags, women who draw, women who illustrate. And I found them, it was really like, it was so much fun uh, because I like researching. And so this is technically pre-production for me, because I do come from film. So the pre-production is like, okay, great, create your tone board, find the people that can figure out, you know, match that tone board. And so you find the people with the same styles, and it was really amazing. I found one, I asked her, she said, no, but I'll be colorist. And then she's like, I'll give you a tweet. And she tweeted, <coughs> so because all her followers are artists. And so I got all my artists off of that, and then from there it's just, who do you have friends? Like, do you have a friend? Yeah. And they give me their Instagrams, and I write them, I cold write them. Uh, and so I have four books going right now, same thing, they're all Latina artists. I'm on my fifth book, as right now that is releasing. So it's been doing really, really well. And now I have Latina, because I do have a non-binary one on my Princess series that is coming out next year. So, you know, I walk the walk, talk the talk type deal, and that I truly believe for everyone. 
Yeah, you do, you do a lot of uh, a lot of hustling and everything, just getting the word out and everything. So I really got to commend you on that. Um, I'm going to give the uh, mic here to uh, my good friend Cruz. Um, talk a little bit. We have, um, we have you here, and you're from uh, an HMC. And our podcast works a lot with them. And I wanted to give a voice to uh, just have that. Um, have um, someone that advocates a lot for um, Hispanics and just people of color in the media. So, so what does NHMC? <clears throat> um, the what What's that? No, go for oh, it. Oh, the National Hispanic Media Coalition. That's good, but don't know. Oh, for people that don't know. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll, I'll have uh, a floor to Cruz. Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Cruz Castillo. Um, <clears throat> Latinx, uh, Latino, Hispanic, uh, Latine. Uh, I'm native. I'm uh, Tijuana, Tepehuan, Nahua, uh, Baizela, uh, Anamashue. Um, my family's from the Southwest, Pueblo natives. Uh, and I work for the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Um, it's a 35-year-old 30, organization that fights for representation. <clears throat> and it started off with uh, fighting for Hispanic rights. Um, I personally don't like the term Hispanic. It's a little antiquated and outdated. and. Uh, one. Um, but uh, <laughs> we fight for Latinos, Latinx, Latine people, but inevitably, like, so much of it is just intersectionality, right? So that crosses over into Asian community, black community, natives, you know what I mean? That's just fighting for everybody when it comes to any of this good stuff. So it's actually really cool to see all y'all making art like this in comics. This is exactly what we're here for. Yeah. Um, but I mostly do film. Uh, I'm getting, I'm writing, I write books, not comics, I'm not that cool, but um, I'm getting my MFA right now at uh, IAIA, which is the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, it's a school for natives, it's a dope school, and uh, I work with amazing authors like Tommy Orange, who wrote There There, I don't know if you guys read books, yeah, but if you do, yeah, he's my mentor, so if you guys ever get out there, read There There, any books by native authors, it's amazing, I guarantee it'll change your life. Uh, but NHMC is dope, and um, we fight the good fight, and we get out there, and we fight across, not just for film, uh, media entertainment, well, media is such a huge thing, period, so we also fight for like, um, oh my god, what is it called? Rights to the internet, Felicia. Rights to the internet. No, but what's the term, the... What do we fight? It's called um, uh, digital advocacy. Digital advocacy. Yeah. But there's like a right to the freedom of the internet. I don't know. I forgot the term right now. <laughs> yeah. But we break it down, right, for the ability for you guys to go on and use like TikTok and, oh my god, I was going to say, net neutrality, yeah, thank neutrality. you. I was going to say Vine, but Vine doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> but like Instagram, RIP, Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff. We fight for the ability for you guys to have access like to the internet. Um, you know, I mean, having rights to the internet is like a, a basic freedom now, right? Like everybody needs the internet for jobs, for work, for family, for friends, anything. Uh, and so we fight for like net neutrality to make sure you have freedom to use Vine. Oh, God damn. Not Vine. Sorry. TikTok. TikTok uh, yeah. Instagram, any of those things. Because, yeah, because net neutrality is, you know, whoever owns the internet, right, can cause traffic to speed up or pick up whatever they want and can force you to go on whatever lanes or sites that they want you to use. And they can charge you to use specific sites. And this influences like uh, creators of color, people that are out there making like content. And they depend so much on just the freedom and openness of the internet, right? So we also fight for stuff like that too. Yeah. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about, I know we've went into uh, some of our backgrounds, but origin stories, just any I adversity that you experienced um, just breaking in or any pushback in uh, your own work or your own life, let's, let's give the floor to that. Um, you know, I'm a, you know, his Hispanic person. I've uh, been working in film and TV and um, just starting to know, yeah, I went to Cal State Los Angeles and um, just had to build my own network and like constantly put my name out there and uh, apply like crazy and yeah, um, just had to um, deal with a lot of that. How do you guys, um, how do you guys find that just breaking in? Let's talk about that. Uh, Henry? Um, I didn't graduate high school. I dropped out. Um, didn't think I'd amount to anything. 
So I got my high school diploma by paying a charter school 100 bucks and started working full time. So I never thought I'd be a writer and that's all I ever wanted to be, but um, I ended up making it happen. But it was really hard because I would try to pitch the publishers and they wouldn't take me seriously. And um, so I did it myself. I went to Kickstarter and Kickstarted my comics. And because of my time as a radio DJ and comedy and journalism, and uh, I had cultivated a small audience of people that wanted to see me do well. So I was lucky that my Kickstarters had been successful. And I got a job at Top Cow Productions, and they were kind enough to publish what I had Kickstarted and uh, put it out through Diamond, you know, through Image and get Diamond Distribution. And you know, I was at, I was in uh, London a couple of weeks ago, and there's my books there. You know, just kind of living my dream. And uh, comics is an easier barrier for entry. I, I am having a really hard time trying to get into film and television. Um, and uh, so you can make a comic. Like I, I, I equate these like they're like kids. You uh, pay you pay thirty thousand dollars for them to go to college. You do all this work, and once they go to college, they don't like call you back anymore. And you don't <laughs> <laughs> just leave me because like it's out of your system now. So like Helm Gray Castle and Lavo Mayo were just things I focused on, and they were in my heart and in my mind for years. And now they're out, and excited to do to do what's next. And, Everyone's always asking me, when's a movie coming out? When's a TV show coming out? And it's like, I made this for the medium. If anything else comes out of this, fine. But I love comics so much. I got something coming out through DC in July. And once that happens, I can get hit by a bus and I can, you know, have lived the life I wanted to live. So peaceful, yeah. Just a quick question. How did you, um, how did you get that Kickstarter going? Just... How did you find yourself um, working through just you well, know, yeah, out I of the limb? I did a lot of research. I interviewed a lot. I used to write for a, com a comic book website called comicsbeat.com, and I started a, a small blog called Kick Watcher, and I would interview people like Jimmy Palmiotti and Gail Simone and, and ask them questions about crowdfunding and see how they did it, and I would like a serial killer just like stalk so many Kickstarters <laughs> and, and see what they were doing and and mimic what their success was. And, uh, you know, I, I think I'm also, like, lucky to have worked at a bank for four years, so I understand that there's a financial aspect to this. So mm -hmm. I had to raise enough money to pay everyone, not living wages, but almost living wages, to do something that, uh, you know, that I wanted them to do. So everyone got whatever rate they asked for and was able to pay for shipping and taxes. And, yeah, you just, like, have to develop a business strategy. I think like what Kaden's doing right now. She was in the LA Times recently. Yeah, it's a great article. She's, uh, yeah, like, so you interview Kaden after this and ask her questions because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a business. You gotta, you gotta operate as a business because uh, you're gonna just be spinning your wheels and it's gonna be really difficult. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, like, at the end of the day, these are all products to be consumed, but you know, you definitely got to uh, see how it could be marketable. Um, anyone else want to uh, share? Oh, this is, okay. So uh, my adversary, and this was actually one of the worst moments of my life. After I graduated with my bachelor's, I had to go work at Knott's because I just wasn't finding a job anywhere in my industry. I did end up finding one job, and it was designing T-shirts. But the jerk ripped me off and refused to pay me after a week of me driving all the way from Norwalk to Costa Mesa every day. And I took him to court. And I had to go back to my job at Knott's. And then I did find another job, a design job, at a truck making company. But then after seven months, they let me go because it was temporary and they wanted to hire an entry level designer not a designer with the bachelors. So I remember I still had my lawsuit money. My mother-in-law, she sat down with me and she's like, what are you gonna do now? I said, I guess I gotta stick with knots and deal with the abuse until I, grad until I find something in my field. And she's like, what about that grad school in San Francisco? I was like, I can't afford it. It's too much money. And then plus I'd have to go to San Francisco 
in July for three years, and my mother-in-law's Catholic, so she was like, Dios sabe lo que hace, pone sus manos, you're going to grad school, little girl. So for a whole month, I was not allowed to do chores. I had to submit that application, and when I got finally got accepted, um, I went up to San Francisco, my mother-in-law dropped me off. Um, of course, she cried, because she considers me one of her adopted kids. Um, and uh, when I came back from, from grad school, I got really sick, and my job refused to let me go home. I was contagious. I had like sniffles, runny nose, and I was like, I don't feel good. I have a fever. I might kill somebody. And they're like, too bad. You're staying. Wow. And I remember I cried during my lunch break and to my mother-in-law and my boyfriend. I was like, what do I do? And they're like, quit. Oh, no. I'm like, how am I going to pay bills? And uh, my mother was like, you're going to grad school, okay? You worry about school. Don't worry about this job. And besides, they'll replace you if you die anyway. So I turned in my two weeks, and um, I started to focus more on creating comics and creating my own business. And at the time, I tried to apply for disability because the job, unfortunately, did a lot of, a lot of damage to me, mm -hmm. mentally and physically. But disability was like, mental health don't count. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, screw you. So I was like, okay, then I'll start my own business. I'll do my own thing and I'll sell my stuff. And um, during grad school, I ended up in the hospital because I was so focused on my business, I was so focused on trying to finish grad school, I had a mental breakdown and I had to go to the hospital and that's when I realized, you know what, my health is more important than this. So getting out of the hospital, it changed my entire perspective because before then, I never took care of myself. And I grew up with that mentality where it's like, put everyone before you. But after the hospital, I'm like, no, put me before everybody else, before my art, before my comics, and then it's me. And then finally in 2019, I actually graduated with my MFA in comics, ironically. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. And then from there on, you know, I focused more on comics, and again, it was still one of the darkest moments because I still wasn't doing a lot. And I would get so frustrated. I was like, why did I go to school? What was the point of getting this bachelor's and this master's? Why am I here? Like, why am I wasting my time? And there was moments where I wanted to go back to Knott's and beg for my job back. But my boyfriend's like, no, it looks bad now. You're just starting out, but trust me, it's going to get better. And here I am in 2021, my career is taking off, I'm getting more recognized. Um, I started a TikTok account, which blew up, which is scary as crazy. <laughs> An algorithm. But I still wonder why am I doing this? Like, I'm starting to get paid, and I'm starting to get recognized. I have fans from TikTok, I had like 50 yesterday, squealing and going nuts, and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> I didn't hear. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much like how I overcame the darkest moment of my life. And here I am talking to you guys. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you persevered, Mixie. And yeah, that's, a, no, that's an incredible story. And yeah, I mean, you see the, the steps that it takes to, uh, to just get through it. So. Um, I guess going, wrapping up here, I want to ask everyone just how we could be better, be more inclusive. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'll hand the floor off to, uh, to Cruz. Thanks for being late. I guess kind of do it like uh, how to be more inclusive, specifically, like in anything, like what, what you read and what you watch or yeah. what you do. Um, for, all right. Uh, I guess look out for creators like this. Like you guys were saying, you were saying do research. You were saying do research, right? You were saying going on hashtags. You were saying you always want to make sure that every part of your team is diverse and everything. So I definitely feel like 
whatever you do, look out for diversity. Because I also feel that sometimes, like, you know, I grew up predominantly like Native and Latinos around me, and that's still not as diverse as it should be, right? You always need to branch out. So I always take a collective look at your circle and expand and go to look for people you don't commonly talk to or associate with or work with. Um, push your comfortability. I always think that's one, right? I feel very uncomfortable because uncomfortable stuff leads to really cool stuff after. And then inevitably you get comfortable with that uncomfortable. So, uh, y yeah. I don't know. No, I think that's it. I mean, me and you, we've been in college too, so. Yeah, Gene and I met at Cal State Los Angeles, and uh, I also make films, like Kate and I here. Um, we, so Gene and I, w some of our first projects we worked on was together, and Gene also goes out of his way to make sure that his team is always diverse, not only just Latinos, women, uh, queer, any, like, yeah, like anybody, like, all the boxes. Yeah. I'm just thinking of everything. He's, all the projects, Gene's done a lot of projects. <laughs> If you guys find his work, please look it up. He's done a lot of good stuff. Totally agree with Cruz. Um, additionals, so the first one is just be aware, right? Because it's just social consciousness, right? Like if I can say name a Latina artist besides Maxi, but like anyone, name one. You can't. Name an Asian female artist. You can't. Name a female, it will go easier, that does DC or Boom or anything or Marvel. Right? Jen Bartel, I can name one, and that's really sad and pathetic. But this, that's the point, it's, it's conscious awareness. Are you aware of our oppression, of everyone, everyone's marginalized oppression? And the answer is most people are not, honestly. But if you bring it out and you ask, hey, if this is diversity, where is our Afro-Latina? Or where is our Native, where is our Asian, right? Like, we failed up here, honestly. Very, right? because it's not fully diverse. And there's little things like that, like there was a feminist film festival and it was run by all guys. And so, you know, and it's just like, you're not aware. You're trying, you're half-baked, but you're not there. But there's little things like that. And I don't know those guys, but like, I read it. But literally, it was so dumb, I got an article about it. And so little things, like, it's just bring the awareness. Because most people don't know they're doing it wrong. They're trying, or they're not, but most times they do not know. So you give them the benefit of their doubt for their ignorance. And then the second one is use your voice. Like, Cruz has an HMC, right? And he does his film, like, right? They have radio shows. He has a, his podcast as well. Use your voice um, because you have the power, right? Like you're a TikTok. You know, like, you know, like literally everyone has a voice and use it because you don't know who you're reached. You don't know who you're speaking to, who's reading your, or who's on your TikTok, who's on my Instagram. Like Comic-Con found me and I have like 2,000 followers. I'm literally like low radar, but they found me on Instagram and they told me to pitch a panel and I got a free table and X, Y, Z, right? Because like, I'm aware, unaware of my reach, but I do hashtag Latino Supergirls. I do post, you know, left and right because that is my marketing. So those are my two things. It's pretty much awareness. And then use your voice because it is powerful and it can wake people up as well. My turn? Yeah. Oh, snap. <laughs> so, yeah, um, going off, like, what can we do um, for equal representation? Let me see. Because I'm trying to think. Honestly, oh, crap. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> lead by okay. example is also Maxie's. You do lead by example a lot. Don't follow me. I'm a dork. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a space case. No, I think it's like um, just put, you know, like Caden said, make your voice be heard. Don't be afraid to speak up. Um, I am fortunately one of those social anxiety people where I'm afraid to speak up. Unless I have to, then I will. And... Um, I usually try to avoid the cussing when I do, <laughs> like right now. <laughs> um, let's see, push it, like really push that boundary, you know, besides getting your voice out, just like really push these creators, like, hey, we need more representation, we need better representation. Um, and I remember in my, di my comics and diversity class that I took in grad school, um, we were talking about Luke Cage, when he first started, he followed the, stere the, so the stereotypical black man features. He was given that quote, oh, uh, like, was it? Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas, Sweet there you go. Christmas. And my professor, you know, his, his name is John Jennings, and he was a, you know, an African-American male himself, and even he had issues with this, because it's like, black people aren't like that. 
Um, and then going off with Big Bertha, she gave these examples of like food disorders. And it's like, yes, thank you, Marvel, for teaching us women that it's okay to vomit just to be pretty. And by the way, she was a supermodel whenever she was thin, and that even ticked me off even more. Um, we, they had a one Latino superhero, and he was bad. I'm like, is this our representation? And that's why it's like I always encourage people, you know, if you have a voice, if you have a concern, and I remember when I used to work at Knott's, we had, like, angry customers who didn't like something, and I always tell them, if you don't like something, go change it. Go say something. Because they're not going to listen to us, the employees, because they, they don't give a heck about us. But if you, you're the person who has the voice, go do something. And I always say the same thing in comics. If you have a concern, if you have something in the comics industry that you don't like, say something. They'll listen. Trust me. It doesn't look like, but they will listen. Yeah. Got to send a tweet. <laughs> Uh, all great points. I would add uh, diversity and inclusion writers, uh, having responsibility for the big comic book conventions, the publishers, uh, the media, to include a certain percentage of the creators that are coming to this event as an example that 35% need to be from a diverse background, or it could be, you know, um, you know so not everybody can afford a table. There needs to be consideration for uh, people who are economically displaced as well. So. I think it's, it, it starts from the top and it should trickle down. So I feel that responsibility is really on the, on the, on the big guys. And um, I feel like us, we, we know the problem, we're working on it, but I think they can do a better job about that. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, one of the best things I did for myself was during the pandemic, I joined a cycling group called Ride for Black Lives. And it was uh, just a melting pot of a bunch of different people. And I, my personal friends group grew by like, in, a, in an amazing way. So like, yeah, comics are great and all, but like, try to do something else <laughs> that isn't comics. Whether it be pottery or painting like Bob Ross, or I don't know, the checkers. Find a checkers group or a dancing group or something. I don't know. I think like expanding what you're doing outside of comics is also really important. Like film and TV or prose or poetry and just get a different perspective. But when it comes to the diversity, uh, yeah, like try to support indie bookstores. There's Red Planet Comics in New Mexico. It's the only indigenous comic book store. Uh, there's also so many different, you know, black and uh, Latinx and you know uh, stores that are bringing in new voices, especially here in LA. So uh, do what you can, and uh, yeah, bring bring more people on wherever you are. And uh, that's that's it. That's what I all I got to say. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for saying Red Planet Comics. Those are the homies in New Mexico. So yeah. Um, also, uh, you know, from Peer and HMC, like we do a lot of research and we do a lot of the numbers and crunching and stuff like that and all the boring data stuff, but it's the data stuff that matters. Um, you know, capitalism. So your money does count. So wherever you put your money will influence and change. And you said um, the people at top. And, and at HMC, our president and CEO, uh, Brenda Castillo, she always talks about the real change is going to come from the executive, the C-suites, the people in the boardrooms. And when you put them in power, they're going to be the ones that say, hey, we should have more of these voices or this and that voice, right? And that does trickle down. And that will get these people hired and making their movies and TV shows and bringing their stuff to life and big scale and big time stuff and not just Marvel and DC stuff all the time, right? Um, so push for that. Uh, Bug them on Twitter. Bug them on, because it really does, social media harassing really does work sometimes for these rich people. So, you know, so get on and bug these people. Like, a lot of these board people or their PR companies or their publicists or their, their marketing people or whatever the companies, they will listen because it is money. So the whole idea that you don't have power, like, you really do. Like, they just want your money at the end of the day, right? So if collectively you all get on and start bugging them that you want, 
this or that person in the boardroom to do this or that, or you want them out, you would rather have this or that person. It does, and it can make a difference. So I think you all collectively said, get your voice out there, right? So that is the truth. Get your voice out there. And then, like he was saying, when you get your voice out there, you will find others that are yelling the same stuff you are. So you're not alone in the void. There are other people that feel the same. Guarantee it. Yeah. Well said. Money talks, as they say. Money talks. So we're just wrapping up here. Can everyone uh, say where to find you at? Any anything you want to promote before uh, they kick us out of the room? <laughs> you want to do a restroom, handles? Yeah, yeah, handles. Yeah. You all go first. Okay. I just told I'm at latinasuperheroes.com. My Instagram is also latinasuperheroes. And right now I have a table over at G, so Creators Court. So right there's 100, and then you keep going further to the end. But one over, so Creators Court, right below it. I'm on row G. You got a table? Um, so I'm also on Creators Court and um, Artist Alley. I'm in G table G03. Um, my uh, my Instagram is Casudo Productions, but I do have a website as well. Um, there you'll find the links to all my social media, including my my TikTok. <laughs> I'm in the artist alley C49, and uh, I can be found on Instagram at 357magnumopus, also my website, 357magnumopus.com. Uh, yeah, I'm Henry Barajas. I'm at C43. Um, just look up Henry Barajas on everything, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, I can't wait to meet you, and let's connect. Awesome. Oh, thank um, you. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I right. uh, I'm Cruz Castillo. Um, if you like making films, you can find me at Cruz W. Castillo. Uh, but you guys should look up NHMC and all the great work they do. It's, um, what is it, like 95% women, right, that run that organization, 95% Latinas. I'm literally the only, well, no, me and Martin. But the other, like, eight or nine are women. And... Uh, they're a really great organization. They, lot, they do a lot of good stuff. And honestly, uh, I was proud of that organization before I worked there. And I'll be proud, I'm sure, one day when I won't work there anymore. So look up NHMC on Twitter, Instagram. They're having a big gala tonight with Salma Hayek, Tessa Thompson, Rosie Perez, the Saldana sisters, Zoe and Cicely and Mariel. God, I hope I'm remembering this right. Matthew Lopez, who just made Tony Award history. Uh, he's a Latino, and he's queer. Um, yeah, check it out tonight. It's free tickets. Uh, NHMC.org. So, uh, yeah, look them up. Cool. And uh, thank you, guests, for joining us. Uh, my co-host, Nick. Nick, come up here. Join us. He'll say our uh, handles and everything. As we're wrapping up, I'm sure uh, we're out of time. So, Nick, where can uh, everyone find us at? This was Serving Up Comics. Yeah, so you can... Sorry about that. So yeah, you can, serve, you can find us at Serving Up Comics. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, what was it? We are coming out with a website very soon. So please go to YouTube, uh, Serving Up Comics. It is also under the Waffle Press branding. So if you guys can, go ahead and follow us on our Instagram, Facebook, everything. It's all Serving Up Comics and Waffle Press. Um, yeah, if you want to find us there, uh, you can also find me at, at the Nick Valero on Instagram and Facebook. Gene? Yeah. Let me on Gene9892. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. watching. We've been professionally unprofessional.